shot silent. So everything that's photographed with no sound and every sound you hear in the film was done in post-production. So it freed me up in terms of directing the film to do it in terms of silent film style. I didn't actually have a megaphone and I didn't shout at the actors, but I was able to talk to them and work in a completely different way. Um, and in terms of working with actors, it was a really intriguing um, experiment in terms of how to achieve performance, how to achieve narrative and story without using dialogue. That's really what I have to say about Jeffrey Bean and, and the three films. I, if you have questions, comments, discussion about any of the work, I welcome it. I have all your records. You have all my records. <laughs> you mean we have the same musical collection? <laughs> yes. This is a subset of my collection. I see. It's one of my favorite subsets. Well, good. So it means we have we have <laughs> we have musical taste in common. I see the Young Marble Giant. Yes. Yeah. An amazing album. That was for happy making. Yes. Yes. I live in a kind of musical universe to begin with, and my, I couldn't play my music since I got here. So I've been really jonesing for my game. And there I go. And the third uncle piece, that was really preternatural for me because for those who are wondering, if they want to know what's inside my mind most of the time, that's pretty much all the time. So that was very, it was unnerving to see somebody crawl inside my head with them. So that was, it was cool. probably one of the pieces that was the most interesting to work in terms of formal because uh, formal editing. So I think you can see in terms of all the cutting, there's a kind of mania for clarity and precision in the editing. That was kind of the, the forte of the video work I did during the 90s was this kind of you know incredibly precisely cut uh, piece. And all the more intriguing to me now about the tools that I used then, which was a three-quarter inch straight cut editing system that required lining up the in point, lining up the out point, previewing the edit, having the pre-roll happen, you know, trying out the edit. And in that tape, their whole passage of it, where I was cutting one and two frame edits all the way through, which was an experimentation around motion. What I found, what I thought, you know, what happens when you do a series of one and two frame edits? Do you have a strobing effect? But in fact, there's a kind of fluidity um, to the interweaving um, of both images. It's almost like, I don't know, um, fabric weaving. I've seen one I've image. I've done myself, you get a retinal retention of the multiple frames, you it's a melting effect. Yeah. Which is intriguing. And I think that, I mean, really, in a lot of ways, the, you know, the personal, emotional, conceptual frameworks that motivate the work were one way of making the work. But another thing that really defined these works were the kind of means of production, the tools that I used, um, particularly the editing technology, which has really changed my work. And I think that um, you know, having Final Cut Pro sort of liberated me to use the dissolve again, almost to an extreme degree. And now I'm sort of finding a balance again um, in terms of you know um, synthesizing some of this previous work with the more contemporary stuff. Yeah. Um, I uh, found the the piece that goes from 91 to 99, 
are really nostalgic. And I, I don't know if it's um, nostalgia for, uh, say, the, the piece that had the list of names, people who are gone, or uh, nostalgia for, this is it, the one, well, anyway, the text, etc. I I don't know if it's real nostalgia or what I'm saying, or if it's just my memory of that era, you know, which I, I think was really kind of amazing in terms of uh, experimental work. Um, and also uh, what I, you know, well, you know, getting over that for a bit just to look at the work, um, I, I, uh, I think the camera, um, like, so clearly uh, differentiates between making a piece of something and making a piece about something. And I feel like uh, your camera was so clearly of wherever you were. And uh, it's just a, a really, I don't know, that distinction was never quite so clear for me before. Thanks. Yeah, it was, I think, an interesting part of the creation of all that super eight footage. Those I was caught today shooting with my mini TV camera at the mountains of the wildflowers. So who knows? Sauce Bay may end up in something. <laughs> but I think that there's something about the kind of engagement because it, I am about as far from a documentary maker as you can get. It's just, it is absolutely not what I do. And so one of the ways I destabilized, I had a great experience when I was an undergraduate and studied painting, and the artist John Baldessari came for our final critique. And he said something to me that probably he said to thousands of art students, but of course it was coming to me. So it was coming for me. And he said, what is the thing you're most afraid of in your work? And I didn't have an answer for him. He said, once you identify it, plunge, plunge headlong towards it. And I've actually taken that advice to heart, whether he meant it for me or not. It's really been instructive. And one of the ways in terms of the use of camera was to be exposed in a public situation in photograph documentary style is mortifyingly uncomfortable for me. And that was a kind of interesting thing to go out in the world and be in the action. Because the, the way I shot, I had to be in the middle. You know, there was a period of time I was traveling all over the world. And there was no, you know, mostly not shooting with wide lens. I mean, with a long lens, I'm mostly shooting with a wide lens, and I'm right in the middle of the action. Mm -hmm. um, so that whole um, engagement, I think, is really a part of the work. It's great that that comes through. Gee, I wonder why. <laughs> yeah. Of course. And she's known for this um, notion of dislocation and the rupture. And the commentary is in the edit, so she intentionally trying to make the audience feel uncomfortable. And that's a political statement on her part, but I find that your work is profoundly political without creating that sense of dislocation. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the, there's a, a person, um, some of you might know as a maker and a writer, a person named Greg Borowitz, who is activist and a colleague of mine all through the 80s and met him in Act Up, and you know, teaches at the School of the Arts in Chicago. And the two of us used to travel together and do a sort of um, 